Today she is presently rendering the services as the Professor of University Law College, PG Department of Studies and Research in Law, former Principal and Dean, University Law College, Bangalore, former Vice Chancellor in, in Charge, Bangalore University. Professor V. Sudhikesh has authored books, numerous articles and research papers on different areas and has presented papers at various national international conferences on his areas of interest. Under his guidance, a number of students have been awarded doctorate degrees and presently he is guiding many PhD students. Dr. Sudesh is one of the most highly regarded personalities in legal education, distinguished educator, dedicated academician, a leading researcher and an exceptional administrator. A true mentor and a great professional advisor for many teachers and students. He is instrumental in shaping the careers of many of his students. A selfless contributor, to the growth of uh, legal education, an acclaimed author. Uh, he is the most popular and adored teacher among all the batches which he taught across 26 years. Once again, on behalf of St. Joseph's College of Law, uh, I extend a hearty welcome you to sir. Sir, we are privileged to have you with us to address our students. The topic for today's webinar is on the most important and sensitive issue, trafficking of women in examination of anti-human trafficking laws. Sir, I'm sure that our young students will have a great learning experience today afternoon and will be inspired by your address. Over to you, sir. Okay. A warm good afternoon to one and all. Thank you, Dr. Pratima, for those uh, very generous and very kind words about me my, and my work. I don't know whether I deserve that or not. But since it comes from you, who have been my friend, before that a class of a college mate, I think I must believe it to be true. Because such words of praise adds, gives enough confidence, adds energy to the teaching profession so that we continue for many more students to come. My respects to the director, Father Gerald De Souza, sir. Dr. Pratima Prabhakar, the principal of St. Joseph's College of Law. Teachers and students of St. Joseph's College of Law. Research scholars, postgraduate students of law, invitees and others who have voluntarily joined this webinar to know more about the topic. Well, before I begin, let me tell you that my presentation today will speak on the concept of human trafficking, the various forms of human trafficking, the anti-human trafficking, Indian legal regime, international legal regime, a few case laws which may be relevant there and the latest development in this regard. I don't know how much time I have, but till your principal orders me to stop, I will not stop. Anyhow, don't get scared at the beginning of the presentation. I know what is the grasping power of all students, including myself. So I will stop at a time when I feel enough is enough. Okay, let's go. Uh, I think I am allowed to share screen, so I'll share my screen. Just a confirmation whether the slides are visible. Yes, sir, they are visible, sir. Okay, fine. Trafficking of women in examination of anti-human trafficking laws. Before I speak any word on that, you must have heard about trafficking, human trafficking. In these times of pandemic, COVID-19 restrictions, I myself could read so many instances of people being trafficked in rural areas where young ones were sold because of poverty in urban areas where the master, the employer brings in laborers from different parts of India, pays them less than the wage. 
in urban areas where domestic servants were never allowed to go back home neither were paid so these are all instances of human trafficking happening even today one other thing that i would like to say is that probably probably like any like any other crime that is reported in the newspapers in the media in the electronic or the print media human trafficking occupies a very small space in the electronic or the print media and therefore all of us may be pardoned for not spending enough time on this great human right violation nevertheless let's begin to understand what is this grave human right problem well i call it as a menace of human trafficking and evil trafficking of child and women is a serious concern prevalent in india today in fact the latest 2020 united states department of state report on human rights or human trafficking world over keeps india under tier 2 of the ranking system which means that india has do has laws and and is doing much to control human trafficking what it means is much has to be yet to be done to control this menace of human trafficking and india is rated as the source the destination and the transit country for human trafficking if students of law students of geography know how india is located surrounded by its neighbors it becomes a easy transit point for people to come to india from india to move to other places and get involved in human trafficking our own ministry's uh, statistics says that there is an increase of 25% of human trafficking women and children trafficking from the years 20 to 2015 to 2016 there's an increase of 25% and people from the lower caste the tribal communities women and children those groups which are excluded from the development process process of a nation generally fall trap to human trafficking before we venture into looking to what is exactly trafficking we need to spend few minutes in understanding how trafficking is different from migration and smuggling migration is where a person moves from one country to another or within one country you have migrant workers coming here and there people going in search of job etc it can be legal or illegal like people where nations where there is there are conflicts going on armed conflicts going on they migrate to prosperous nations in europe and other places sometimes illegally and that is voluntary also so it is a voluntary movement of people displacement of persons and trafficking are examples of forced migrations then we have smuggling smuggling is the transport of a person of course it is with their consent like it happens when in ships and boats containers they are smuggled to another country through illegal means <coughs> so smuggling has to include crossing of an international border so if you keep these two things in mind migration smuggling you can contradicting trafficking from the the migration and smuggling trafficking basically involves the following core elements movement of a person anyone adult male female child movement of a person with deception or coercion when we study some definitions you will understand this with deception or coercion into a situation of forced labor servitude or slavery like practices so trafficking involves these three core elements movement deception and for exploitation this forced labor servitude or slavery like practices so trafficking can occur with or without crossing an international border so trafficking can occur within a state within a nation the exploitation of the migrant is one of the key factors determining trafficking however it is not relevant for the act of smuggling however smuggling can easily turn into trafficking look here now when 
when a voluntary migrant by placing himself or herself into the hands of a smuggler has put himself or herself into a situation of dependency on the smuggler and there is therefore vulnerability to subsequent trafficking so a smuggled person or a person who migrates and then falls into the trap of traffickers it could become a case of trafficking also so what i'm why i'm trying to explain this is many at a times people first voluntarily migrate or get smuggled out of the country later on due to this due to their compulsiveness they can get involved into trafficking who are the victims of trafficking anyone can be a victim of human trafficking victims may be men women children different ages different levels of education and you will be surprised to know even educated people people holding good degrees are get into this get get, uh, get stuck into this trafficking problem as victims of any race or ethnicity voluntary migrants escaping poverty gender based discrimination or political persecution who became enslaved individuals seeking better employment and livelihood opportunities who are then tricked into slavery persons abducted involuntarily and held against their will through for, through force fraud or deception so practically there is no qualification you could be a poor person you could be a rich person you could be an educated person you get you fall into this trap because of some compulsionness some fraud some coercion being played upon you we have seen from our neighborhood countries people coming to india in search of jobs they may be educated but they come here they work here maybe in hotel industry maybe in domestic industry domestic servitude domestic as domestic laborers servants though they are educated they get trapped either because they are not paid or less paid or they get into sexual activity therefore i said that anyone can victim a become a victim of uh, trafficking who are these people then is there one person many people you will be surprised to know that human trafficking involves so many people so many agencies sometimes even government agencies i'll tell you how it happens in the check post at borders where the government official the police official is supposed to check the passport etc he is supposed to stop migrants illegally entering sometimes these people are bribed and then they enter so i said even government agencies are responsible for this a trafficker can be working on their own in a small criminal group or in a large scale organized crime network frequently a trafficker is someone that the victim knows on a personal basis most of the times in the case of sexual exploit exploitation the victim knows the trafficker they promise jobs in middle east countries in dubai you must have read in this paper in dubai and abu dhabi and other places they go land there to work in the play in the in the in the business establishment or in the house of arab sheikhs there they get sexually exploited and who have done this the trafficker is a known person a friend a community member so most traffickers have the same nationality as their victim that is what the un doc reports the united nations uh, um, um, organization on drugs and crime so human traffickers may be transnational national or local local criminal organization transnational someone sitting in abu dhabi dubai or in some european nation may ask maybe having uh, maybe wanting human traffickers neighbors friends family members village chiefs returnees agricultural operators owner of small or medium sized businesses pimps and brothel owners independent operators diplomatic families look here diplomatic families police government authorities military individual members of peace keeping missions all them of all of them can play a particular role in this entire uh, chain of human trafficking Traf- types of human trafficking of course today we are concentrating only on the trafficking of women for sexual purposes but then 
there are various types of human trafficking trafficking done for for different kinds of exploitation child sex trafficking child soldiers debt bondage what we call bonded labor under the indian law and the indian system forced labor involuntary involuntary domestic servitude and sex trafficking so yes these are the various forms of trafficking i am trying to take you through all these slides to get the basics idea very clear because human trafficking like any other criminal offense is not a single act it 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 multiplies into several kinds of exploitation so therefore now we are under a conclusion that because it involves so many kinds of so many people we may classify it as an organized crime in fact that is what it is said that it is the third biggest organized crime recording in progress after uh, uh, drugs and arms after drug illegal drug trade and arms trade illegal arms trade illegal drug trade human trafficking is considered as the third organ biggest organized crime and look at the profits human trafficking earns global profits of roughly 150 billion us dollars a year for traffickers because money is exchanged from one person to another person the person who recruits the person who transports the person who shelters the person who exploits all of them have their share of money 99 billion us dollars of which comes only from commercial sexual exploitation so statistics in this regard say that of all the kinds forms of human trafficking sexual exploitation is the maximum kind of human trafficking and human trafficking networks can operate successfully only when there is some kind of coordination of efforts among recruiters transporters transporters and exploiters these three interconnected networks are separated only by their product the product of course here is a individual a human being yeah mm why is my slide not moving what the band let me stop share and uh, i'll try to once again share some problem one minute okay once again i share one no 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 there's some problem okay 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 yeah we are here elements of human trafficking mm, shall i make it full slide or this is enough this is visible yes sir it is visible sir okay, okay okay so in between some of you can nod your head yes no because then i'll be sure that all of you are listening to me otherwise it's a dr pratima is smiling i know most of the <laughs> times we think that the audience is listening maybe just logged in and doing some of the having sipping coffee or something like that and anyway, i'll try to keep you engaged so <clears throat> if you go by what's the definition i mean if you go by the description that i gave just now we may say that the human trafficking involves the three things act means purpose what are the acts recruitment transport transfer harboring receipt of a person and like if you go by the ipc definition of theft of decoity of various other crimes you will find only one single act but here we find recruitment transport transfer harboring receipt of persons and the various means through which it is done threat or use of force coercion abduction fraud deception abuse of power look here abuse of power or vulnerability a boss a master one having control a guardian including a parent one who has power over the other person giving payments or benefits these are the main means through which it is and purpose all kinds of exploitation prostitution for others sexual exploitation forced labor slavery or similar practices removal of organs and other types of exploitation is equal to trafficking so when you speak about human trafficking you must understand that basically it involves 
these three elements act means and purposes yeah so if you conceptually want to understand human trafficking we may say it is a process there is a target and these targets are human being women children men and there is exploitation for what for economic gain and traffic for a range of purposes simply forced uh, exploitative labor as a labor in factories as in as in labor in farms in private households sexual exploitation and forced marriage also and trafficking is one such offense evil menace which affects all regions and most countries of the world there is no difference here between a developed or a developing a rich or a poor nation a poor nation could be where from where people are sent for trafficking a rich nation could be exploiting nation so rich poor doesn't matter all regions of the world are affected by one or the other form of forms of human trafficking i think great about these causes we all know we all know very simply that poverty uneven employment gender discrimination at least in india harmful traditional cultural practices such as the devadasi system lack of proper policy implementation etc are some of the causes of human trafficking people come in search of employment now if you look at karnataka itself in karnataka if you look at bangalore itself so many people come interested migrants come educated uneducated all of them come to work as skilled unskilled labor because the employment scenario is not equally distributed not only within karnataka but also within india poverty of course one region gender discrimination another region we have some practices in andhra pradesh in karnataka of the devada system where girls are dedicated as uh, to temples goddess and they get exploited sexually all these are some of the cultural reasons almost 80% of worldwide trafficking is for sexual exploitation with an estimated 1.2 million children being bought and sold into sexual slavery every year these are some of the facts which i got through my research and india <clears throat> is still a nation being used by traffickers as a receiving nation as a sending nation and transit country what makes this possible is between some of our neighbors the the border is porous we say india and nepal porous borders you can just walk into india walk into nepal this helps movement of people illegal illegally women and children are the main victims of human trafficking in india then they are forced into prostitution forced marriage domestic work in fact a report published by the government of india, india states that there are approximately 10 million sex workers in india I and mean, that's too low this is actually it's more than that this is an official figure of which 1 lakh belong to mumbai alone which is considered the asia's largest sex industry center so that, that is the situation within india you can imagine worldwide what would be the problem of um, the uh, sex industry or the sexual exploitation of women now let us come to this law about which i have titled as anti women trafficking of women and what are the laws we are examining this in on par with other human trafficking laws as all of us know this law was enacted to ratify an international convention with regard to suppression of immoral trafficking which was enacted in the year 1950 hardly few amendments have taken place but basically the act suppresses or controls trafficking in women for sexual purposes <coughs> in india there are over 3 million sex workers according to 2007 again old statistics the majority of adult sex workers voluntarily plying the trade when a raid and rescue is conducted many such women who have made a consensual business agreement with a client are also detained or sent to shelter homes without ask, being asked if she wishes to leave the trade what happens is the itpa law 1956 is generally used for raid and rescue go raid information received by the police officer concerned that prostitution is going on in a particular building particular house particular locality police officers go there the raid the house the building you must have seen these things in movies 
and try to rescue them. But what is the reality here? The reality is there are in many urban areas where women enter into consensual sex, which may not be on, on, on par with the prostitution that the law tries to see. Here you are rescued. But where are you sent again? Where is the woman sent again? That's the problem with the ITPA law. Anyhow, if you go by section wise, these are some of the sections which punish the activities involving uh, trafficking of women for sexual purposes. The first section of the act has provisions that outline the illegality of prostitution. Basically, prostitution is considered as illegal. Except, of course, for certain permitted areas in certain places in India like Bombay and Delhi. So the first section of the act has provisions that outline the illegality of prostitution and the punishment for owning a brothel or a similar establishment or for living of earnings of prostitution as in the case of a pimp. If a pimp lives on the earnings of prostitution, he is also punished. Section 5 of the act states that if a person procures, induces or takes a child, so we are trying to include even a child uh, prostitute also here. The case of a child being a prostitute, you being used as a prostitute. Section 5 of the Act states that if a person procures, induces or takes a child for the purpose of prostitution, then the prison sentence is a minimum of 7 years, but it can be extended. To ensure <coughs> that the people in the chain of trafficking are also held responsible, this Act has a provision that states that any person involved in recruiting, transporting, transferring, harboring or receiving of a person for the purpose of prostitution if guilty of trafficking. In addition, any person attempting to commit trafficking or found in the brothel or visiting the brothel is punishable under this law. Furthermore, if a person is found with a child, it is assumed that he has detained the child there for the purpose of sexual intercourse and hence shall be punishable. If a child is found in a brothel and after medical examination has been found to have been sexually abused, it is assumed that the child has been detained for the purpose of prostitution. So therefore, we find that this particular law through various sections has tries to make the act of prostitution illegal by making the people involved in this entire process guilty of the offences specified in those sections, whether it is section 5, 5A, 5B, 5C, section 6, etc. One of the problems of this particular law is that under section 8, even the person engaged in prostitution is also considered as a criminal for the purpose. Keeping in view the reality of the Indian situation, we find that many a times, Women enter the sex, the sexual sex trade for poverty, for certain compulsions. So, in that sense, this particular law does not do justice to a person who is found doing this. So, it is in that sense not pro women. Actually, it should have been pro women. Fine. We move on. <clears throat> I'm not going to the legal definition of what is a brothel, etc., etc. That is there for you to study in the ITPL law, it may consume more time. But I am just trying to give you a, a particular view of this particular ITPL law. So, it is said that this ITPL law is like a law which only curbs visible prostitution wherever someone receives a phone call where it is found and incarcerate the offending woman at protective homes restricting her freedom, denying her agency and imposing a one-size-fits-all rehabilitation plan on her. Under the ITPL law, a victim who is uh, rescued can make an application for her to be sent to a protection home, provide care for her. Under section uh, <clears throat> 21 also, the protective homes can be established by state government. So, the people, critics of this law say, look here, this law does not go into the root of addressing immoral trafficking, the root of addressing the problem of sexual exploitation of women. Rather, it, it conducts a raid, rescues the women, 
protects them, puts them in the home without realizing whether she has come on her own, whether there was some force applied, what is the reason so that internationally it is agreed now that if you have to address the problem of human trafficking, you must address the root causes which leads to the human trafficking, addressing poverty issues, addressing gender discrimination issues, etc., etc. And further, this particular law also ignores the reality of bonded labor victims who are trafficked every day across this country to work under exploitative conditions. You know, bonded labor is a condition where a person is bonded as a laborer for clearing a debt which his parents, his ancestors have made to a particular landlord. So, he continues to be bonded. So, many a people are trafficked for bonded labor, young persons, sometimes for organ removals and girls for domestic servitude <coughs> or forced marriage. So, what happens is, some of these bonded labor may also fall into for sexual, may be exploited for sexual purposes. So, the ITPA law does not look into this particular aspect that a particular woman was actually bonded labor for working as a domestic servitude but has landed up here to work as a sex, uh, work, in the, work as a prostitute. So, that is one lacuna in this particular law. So, many criticize the ITPA law. We will see what comes next. <clears throat> so, the law was amended in 1986 and never reviewed since. It criminalizes organized prostitution. Organized, wherever you know it's being carried on, but does not address the status of a sex worker who operates alone. That's a very common factor in urban areas and cities. Such a sex worker might in fact be more exposed to the risk of violence at the hands of a client. Working in premises closer to other sex worker practices may be safer for them. ITPA has no provision for Rehabilitating the sex worker, it rescues without their it rescues without their consent. No guidelines for investigation of trafficking crimes. Whether a, a, a person who is involved in prostitution is the result of trafficking or not, that is not provided under the ITPA law. So there is no provision for any victim compensation, and there are hardly any facilities facilities to um, connect the rescued worker with health services because today. Internationally, it is said that most of the people who are involved in sex, in, 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 get ex sexually exploited in prostitution are also a cause of major health hazards. So, they, they, they don't get health facilities also. That is also overlooked under the ITPL law. So, sex trafficking inventions often involve direct rescue targeted the sex worker irrespective of whether she is a trafficking victim, what is her age, what is her wish whether she wants to continue in commercial sex trade. <clears throat> As her consent, op opinions and choices are disregarded in the process of rescue, she may encounter disrespect, indifference and violence at different points on the, uh, on the rescue and rehabilitation pathway. Because without even knowing why she has landed there, whether she consents for rescue and rehabilitation, Without knowing this, if you send her to for rescue and rehabilitation, she may again be condemned by another set of people, either when she is in the police personnel or whether under the care of shelter home staff or even members of the civil society. Because once you are targeted as a prostitute, already you know what is the status of women in India because of certain practices that were done on her. When she gets caught into this particular prostitution racket, she further, her, her position further deteriorates. Anyhow, so that is the brief about the trafficking of women, the problems, the law. And what question here is, if people know the trafficking such an evil, they can get exploited, why and how do they join this? So, researchers have said by investigating there are two factors here for all sorts of trafficking, whether it is sexual trafficking, forced labor, push and pull factors for human trafficking as they call. What is this push factor and pull factor? By push factors, we mean to say those factors 
that induces the victims to move out of the country of origin under expectation of something better in life. So someone coming from a very poor country or someone coming from a village itself, looking at the glitz and glamour, they may say, okay, if I go to Bangalore, if I go to Dubai, if I go to Abu Dhabi, I may have something better in life. This is one factor which, which attracts them and they fall victim to human trafficking. Pull factors. I said, the glitz and the glamour of the developed countries, developed states, developed cities at the destination country. Someone who is far away from Bangalore, MG Road, Brigade Road, all these grown-ups, all these malls, etc. When he looks into the picture, he or she looks into the picture. Oh, say, well, life is fantastic there. People look at the pictures of Abu Dhabi, Dubai, many, many other countries. So the glitz and glamour of those countries pulls them. It attracts them as a magnet. And they desperately go there without knowing whether they are going legally, illegally, what happens to them. They fall into the network of traffickers waiting at the borders. You must have read in newspapers how mother and daughter both were trafficked by a known person who was a taxi driver. And this taxi driver used to drive his taxi very often <clears throat> from city to the airport. It actually happened in Hyderabad. City to airport. So while he frequents, during his frequent traveling, dropping of the customers, he makes contact with some international traveler. Then he meets this mother and daughter, tells them, okay, I know someone who can help you out getting a job in Dubai. So mother and daughter both get passports done. Since the traffic, the, the car driver, the taxi driver is known to them, they don't doubt. <coughs> On receiving certain commission, he transports them to Dubai. On landing in Dubai, mother is employed in, a, in the uh, a house of the Arab Sheikh. Daughter is employed in the business establishment. Bo both of them, the passports are seized. Both are exploited. Mother is exploited as domestic servitude. Daughter is exploited as a, uh, or sexually exploited. This, this happened few years back. This is the reality, push and pull factor. Now let us <clears throat> straight away land into some relevant international legal framework because without understanding what is going on at the international level, it will be difficult to, for you to understand how big a problem this is. In fact, I give full credit to the International Labour Organization because it was the first organization, international organization much before the UN could come who actually thought about a kind of human trafficking that is forced labor and adopted a convention in the year 1930 wherein it stated that forced labor is defined as all work or service which is exacted from any person under the menace of any penalty and for which the said person has not offered himself voluntarily. This convention is the most ratified convention among all the ILO conventions. So therefore, I classify this particular ILO convention is the first international convention directly speaking on the prevention of human trafficking or recognizing a kind of human trafficking that is forced labor. Then, of course, we spoke about this earlier when I referred to the ITPA law. The ITPA law is as a result of this convention. This convention specifically declares that the main reason behind the commercial sexual exploitation of women and children is their dependency. And it is against their dignity and fundamental rights. Women and children get exploited because they have to depend upon their husband or father or brother, whoever as the case may be. This economic dependency makes them go out of the way to satisfy their own economic fulfillment and they get land up in prostitution. So that factor is recognized under this convention. <clears throat> the convention provides a number of activities which aims at preventing commercial ex sexual exploitation and at restriction on pornography through criminalization, punishment of all forms of acquirement, member states commit themselves to eliminating all forms of discrimination that ostracizes victims of commercial sexual exploitation. So as a result of this, we have the ITPA law 1956. One other significant uh, effort at the international level in classifying human trafficking 
as an organized crime because this was the time when it was realized that if you have to deal with human trafficking and its various forms of trafficking we need to have a single approach a single convention which could probably include everything which is involved in human trafficking and therefore in the year 2000 we had this convention convention on a transnational organized crime convention the convention has 41 articles that requires state parties to criminalize among other things what participation in an organized group so maybe you are a taxi driver someone is an international traveler someone else is there who takes the passport all of them all all these people would be prosecuted by considering them they are participating as an organized they may not know each other that's irrelevant here but if they if they participated in this process that entire activity would be uh, would be called as would be so rather classified as criminal would be classified as criminalized the laundering of proceeds of crime corruption etc all have to be criminalized state parties are additionally obligated to adopt measures for the prosecution of offenders and for the confis confiscation and seizure of inter alia the proceeds of such crime each protocol within this convention sets out a number of obligation for each of these three specific sub areas of transnational organized crime that are focused upon so for the first time in the year 2000 human trafficking is now considered as a transnational organized crime i told you much before this this slide could come that it affects all countries irrespective of developed developing poor rich therefore now it is a transnational organized crime <clears throat> okay now let it let's look into what is the domestic legal regime against human trafficking what is the law what how does our legislation deals with it of course we have the constitution <clears throat> of india which basically through the preamble and through the fundamental rights prohibits human trafficking recognizes certain kinds of trafficking i'll come to that a little later so here <clears throat> when we speak about dealing with trafficking we have two strands of criminal law which is the general criminal law the indian penal code 1860 and we have specific laws targeting a specific form of human trafficking the itpa or the sita as they call which just now we studied then we have the bonded labor abolition act 1976 in case of forced labor then we have the child labor abolition in case of child labor in order to prohibit the cultural practice of devadasi leading to trafficking we have the karnataka devadasi prohibition of dedication act 1982 we have the andhra pradesh devadasi prohibition dedication act 1989 certain sections of the it it act provides prohibits trafficking that is online trafficking the juvenile justice care and protection law the goa children's act the pokso law etc etc what we find here is that one criminal law under ipc will i have section 370 i'll come to that little later and special laws sexual exploitation one law bonded labor one law child labor another law devadasi system another law online human trafficking another law uh, exploitation of children another law etc etc so multiple laws now we come to section 370 of the ipc i said ipc itself has got several provisions which make one or the other act involved in human trafficking as an offense be it forced labor or sexual exploitation but i am talking about a particular section here that is section 370 so research indicates that since the passage of section 370 in a total of 120 what is three section 373 363 section 370 ipc enacted in the 2000, 2013 defines trafficking in consonance with the international definition and makes all acts involved the means the acts the purpose everything is confined in section 370 brought into section section 370 and it is punished as a case of human trafficking so section 370 can be considered as one brahmas or one weapon which can deal with all kinds of human trafficking therefore research says that 
between the years April 2013 to July 2018. Section 370 has been used by several magistrates along with other provisions of the law in, in, in holding a person guilty of human trafficking. For example, it has been used under the ITPL law 32 times. Section 370 has been used 32 times under the ITPL law. Section 370 has been used 8 times under the Bonded Labor Abolition Act, 8 times under the Child Labor Abolition Act, 22 times within IPC provisions of rape, sexual harassment, outrage, 27 times under the POXO law, 23 times under the JJ Act and other provisions 69 times it has been used. So what we call is that <coughs> the Indian Penal Code through section 370 is a standalone offence, is a standalone section which, is, which has a standalone offence on trafficking which prohibits all kinds of punishes, all kinds of activities which are involved in human trafficking by criminalizing them. <coughs> yeah. So now let us come to the Constitution of India. Now, it should be very clear now at this stage to you that I have spoken about IPC and other special laws. IPC section 370 a standalone section making every activity involved in human trafficking a crime and requisite punishment. All other laws independently punish, prohibit human trafficking. Sexual labor, bonded labor, child labor, Devadasi, Poxo, JJ Act. Now we have our constitution. As all of us know, the Indian constitution prohibits trafficking in persons by recognizing many international, uh, many international conventions. It provides for, for, for life, right to life, liberty, equality, freedom, etc., etc. The Constitution of India, therefore, can be considered through its preamble, through the various rights and through the direct principles as one big weapon, moral weapon rather, a moral armory which helps other legislation, specific legislation to control human trafficking. If I have to pick up one particular article under the constitution, I will pick up article 23, which directly speaks about trafficking in human beings and beggar and other, rather prohibits traffic in human beings and beggar and other similar forms of forced labor. Now, article 23 has certain features. What are they? Article 23 itself is a right against exploitation and it protects both citizens and the non-citizens against exploitation. It protects individual against the state as well as private citizens. So, article in order to take the rescue of Article 23, the trafficking need not have been only done by a private entity, but you can make also the state also a party, party in, in, in getting your rights under Article 23. <clears throat> so, Article 23 prohibits beggar, that is a form of forced labor, which means involuntary work without any remuneration. In other words, it can be said that a person is compelled to work against his will without being paid for it. Article 23 also prohibits bonded labor as it is a form of forced labor as per this article. I have told you that bonded labor is that where a person is forced to work to pay off his debt. Now, why I brought in this definition here is many a times, insofar as trafficking is concerned, many a times, insofar as a crime is concerned, as law students, lawyers, policy makers, we need to understand how a particular act is covered within the definition. So I spoke about the 2000 Organized Crime Convention. Under that particular protocol, the definition is as follows. Which when I read, you will understand that all activities uh, linking to human trafficking, leading to human trafficking, probably covered. This definition is what is included in section 370 of IPC. What is that? It defines trafficking in person as recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring or receipt of person 
by means of threat or use of force or other forms of coercion of abduction of fraud of deception of the abuse of power or of position of vulnerability or of the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation exploitation at the minimum shall be the exploitation of the prostitution of others or other forms of exploitation forced labor services slavery practices similar to slavery or servitude or the removal of organs so this definition under the protocol organized convention protocol is a very comprehensive definition which probably helps uh, under uh, which is uh, which helps all nations to draft their laws as per this definition so that no one escapes no, no one who is involved in the chain of trafficking escapes similarly we had a sar convention 2002 wherein also we agreed to have a convention for the purpose of human trafficking but this sar convention has got a different the definition unlike the 2000 convention definition of the united nations some i don't know why the definition has been different it only deals with a particular kind of uh, trafficking that is sexual exploitation and it defines that trafficking uh, is defined as the moving selling or buying of women and children for prostitution with within and outside a country for monetary or other consideration with or without the consent of the person subject to the traffic so if you go back to this definition 2000 and this definition you will understand that the sark nation definition is very narrow only limited to a prostitution of women that's prostitution of women and child that is between india nepal and pakistan other countries fine so however the uh, just for the sake of information uh, under this convention the judicial authorities in member states have to act confidentially they have to reciprocate with each other they shall pass on information with reg- with regard to uh, persons involved in uh, trafficking and if possible they have to extradite the persons uh, not only extradite the criminals involved in this for example in india if a nepalese or a bangladeshi or a pakistani person gets involved in trafficking as an agent he must be extradited to that particular country and similarly the victim has to be transported to the other country these agreements are part of the convention now <clears throat> let us come to the final part of my presentation uh, with the permission of the host can i take another 15 minutes okay okay no problem even if you don't want even if you say no sir enough i will not stop here because one or two cases are very important for our children for our students to understand how seriously the judiciary is dealt we started at 3 or 3 5 i have spoken about almost 50 minutes another 5 minutes you can bear with me then i will stop thank you <coughs> yeah so <clears throat> uh, basically understand that supreme court and the high courts in india have played a very active role in the rehabilitation of trafficking victims the supreme court in fact has ordered many governments the nhrc and many other organization to have proper policies for rehabilitation for rescue and for implementing the very strictly in fact because of the supreme court's order several vigilant committees have been formed and the lower courts the trial courts have been functioning more effectively because of the direct order received by the supreme court and the high courts we have one particular case which of course i feel is a very landmark case it is a landmark case not only because <clears throat> we spoke about a public interest litigation being filed in a case of bonded labor um, uh, it's not because of that it is because of the interpretation given to article 23 which i feel is very 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 touching and a very illustrative thing of how exploitation could take place so just to go back with, within few minutes on what is this case all about probably most of you have read about this this is a case where various labor laws were violated minimum wages law equal remuneration act so many other children were employed because contractors who were engaged to construct the asian games village were exploiting by detecting commission women were paid less than the men so many violations because no one could sp- speak up or no one could file a case because the laborers were illiterate this pucl an ngo filed this case and we have the law <coughs> yeah so here speaking about article 23 i i quoted that article at the beginning the court said it is article 23 with which we are concerned and that article is clearly designed to protect the individual not only against the state but also against the private citizen 
Article 23 is limited in its application against the state. It is not limited, sorry. It is not limited in its application against the state. But it prohibits trafficking human beings and beggar and other similar forms of forced labor practiced by anyone else. The sweep of Article 23 is wide and unlimited and it strikes at trafficking human beings and beggar and other similar forms of forced labor wherever they are found. So that is the important uh, judgment. And one other thing which Justice Krishna, I suppose, said about Article 33 is what Article 23, sorry, 23 prohibits is forced labor. That is, labor or service which a person is forced to provide and force which would make such labor or service forced labor may arise in several ways. It may be physical force which may compel a person to provide labor or service to another or it may be force exerted through legal provision such as a provision for imprisonment or fine in case the employee fails to provide labor or service or it may even be compulsion arising from hunger and poverty. Look here, even without any force, a compulsion which arises from hunger and poverty, want and destitution. Consider the case of a bonded labor, consider the case of a domestic labor, consider the case of a women involved in prostitution. Do you think they would have voluntarily entered? Many of them, the compulsion would be hunger, poverty, want and destitution. So all this will be considered as forced labor. So Article 23 for me is the most important constitutional weapon or moral base through which we can stop human trafficking if judges start applying this interpretation. Any factor which deprives a person of choice of alternatives, look here, any factor which deprives a person of choice of alternatives and compels him to adopt one particular course of action may properly be regarded as force and if labor or service is compelled as a result of such force, it would be forced labor. What a beautiful um, narration of Article 23 by the Supreme Court. Further, I won't stop here. This is one paragraph. It's very interesting. Please, uh, read. when I read this paragraph, imagine how migrant laborers, domestic workers, so many other pay, uh, workers, helpless people during the pandemic suffered due to the lockdown. See what just judges have written. Where a person is suffering from hunger or starvation, when he has no resources at all to fight disease or feed his wife and children or even to hide their nakedness, where utter grinding poverty has broken his back and reduced him to a state of helplessness and despair, where no other employment is available to alleviate the rigor of his poverty, he would have no choice but to accept any work that comes his way, even if the remuneration offered to him is less than the minimum wage. He would be in no position to bargain with the employer. He would have to accept what is offered to him and in doing so, he would be acting not as a free agent with a choice between alternatives, but under the compulsion of economic and circumstance, economic circumstances. And the labor or service provided by him would be clearly forced labor. So this, I feel, is a very beautiful judgment um, written in the uh, Asia case. Well, we have other cases. Justice Bhagwati said that if you don't pay minimum wage to person who are employed in famine relief work, that itself amounts to forced labor or human trafficking by the state itself. It's a case where in order to provide relief for famine, the government gave some voluntary work but paid less than the minimum wage. So the court said nothing doing. If you're providing work, pay the minimum wage. Even that is a case of forced labor. Similarly, uh, when you take uh, work from the prisoners and don't pay, you're violating Article 23 because that is also a kind of exploitation. <clears throat> Similarly, we have Lakshmikan Pandey versus Union of India where adoption... You know, what happens is, in inter-country adoption, ad adoptions, small children, without following the norms of the adoption law or escaping the norms of adoption law, children are exported or uh, given in adoption to foreign parents. And these fo foreign parents, after some time, forget to take care when they have their own child or some other thing happens in the family. And these people are then, either are you sexually exploited or forced labor or domestic servitude or for removal of organs. That was the grave reality that the court encountered in this case and said, that for adoption, the law must be followed strictly. Bandhuva Mukti Mvarcha case, the formation of vigilant, uh, vigilant committees. Yeah, I'll skip all these things. This is one case where the National Human Rights Commission was directed to take part in policies and programs, in training programs for the purpose of eradicating human trafficking. I'll come to the last part. The last two things or three things that I would like to say is that 
we had a bill titled as trafficking of persons prevention protection rehabilitation bill 2018 which of course has lapsed wherein one holistic law one law covering all acts of human trafficking were to be controlled regulated punished <coughs> by having protective homes rehabilitation funds designated special courts etc etc so this law lapsed wherein there was provision for having anti human trafficking cells at the district level state level central level coordination between all these three uh, anti trafficking units uh, rehabilitation rescue uh, providing employment opportunity uh, sending the the trafficked victims to the destination countries or villages of course this bill lapsed so what is the latest for you the latest is coming here yeah, now bear with me i am coming finally only two more slides so in a recent development just when i was preparing for when dr prathima your very respected famous principal directed me to speak on this topic i said as a teacher it is my duty to tell the latest so luckily for me i could find that just two days back and when i was writing this article when when i was presenting this when i was preparing for this the minister of women and child welfare has invited suggestions and comments for its trafficking in persons prevention care and rehabilitation bill 2021 it is proposed in the bill to make national investigation agency as the main investigative agency to look into cross border trafficking offences the punishment under the new bill are enhanced up to death sentence in certain cases an interesting inclusion in the bill 2021 is to include transgender also as a victim of trafficking so this is the latest that i wanted to tell you but before i tell you some kind of, uh, tell the last sentence now that you have listened to human trafficking and all the problems international conventions please as law students you have a duty to participate in this law making process i think up to july 15th you have time to give your suggestions or objections the bill is available online you can download give your suggestion from the st joseph's college of law led by the principal after this seminar you can sit down read more and try to uh, send your own suggestions finally friends trafficking of person is a grave act of human right violation it deprives the person of human dignity after all we are human beings when a person is trafficked you know his human dignity goes away it's almost like being a slave all the stakeholders in the society must act in unison to eradicate the menace of trafficking in person in order to, in order to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights in the dignity and the worth of human person in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small by borrowed this from the united nations preamble thank you very much i think i have exceeded the time but it is compulsion when i start speaking as a teacher it it becomes a habit sort of a thing sorry for the extended voice thank you very much Thank you so much, sir, for that comprehensive and truly eye-opening presentation. Um, sir, would you be okay with answering a few questions from the audience? Oh, why, why, why not? Let me try if I can answer. Because <laughs> students have already always answered our questions. Let me try to answer their questions. Yeah. Wonderful. So we will now open up the floor for a few questions. Participants, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box, and I will read out the questions as they come in. Uh, while we wait, I will get started with some questions of my own. So, sir, um, naturally, this would vary based on the individual trauma faced. But do you think that it is possible for someone to fully rejoin society once they have been rescued from trafficking? <coughs> Good question. It all depends upon what form of trafficking was. Uh, what form of trafficking was the victim involved in? in so far as sexual trafficking is concerned or sexual exploitation is concerned i believe it's very difficult to get back to society because the society 
is not ready to accept you back into the normal framework of society. In case of bonded labor, child labor, domestic servitude, probably we have much to do. We can definitely put them back into shape by giving them alternative employments, by the government coming to rescue their debts, clearing off their debts, by shutting down the industries or the places where bonded labor is carried on, by prosecuting the employers who, uh, who involve domestic slavery. But insofar as prostitution is concerned, a little difficult. For that, you and me collectively must try to build a social fabric where we say that this is all fine. Please know that the prostitution is the oldest profession in India. Practiced oldest profession. Therefore, society must try to accept them back. It is possible to rehabilitate them. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question in the chat which says, Sir, you said that Mumbai is the only place where prostitution is legalized, right? Isn't it contrary to all the struggles that they have made to create bills, amendments and acts to prohibit it? Yes, true. We are double speaking. On the one hand, we say that prostitution is immoral, illegal. But on the other hand, we have permitted certain places to operate as brothels as prostitution. So it's a question of immorality of the society. Well, my dear friend, please also know that there are so many families in Mumbai, in Pune, in Delhi, where these women have life dependent upon their sexual activity. So therefore, it's a licensed form of a sexual activity. Unless we as a society have one moral thinking, probably this is a difficult question to answer and also to practice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, the next question in the chat says, <coughs> Sir, could you please throw some light on Stockholm Syndrome? Oh my God. Let me... Um, uh, uh, let me submit that... Uh, I am not prepared for that. Of course. Because, uh, uh, I don't know, I know how it is linked to human trafficking. Mm -hmm. But if the student can explain, probably I can help her out. We can move on to the next question in the meanwhile. Yeah. Uh, the next question says, So what reforms do you think have to be brought about to protect, protect the sex workers and the rescued sex workers against prevalent STDs, considering the fact that they are deprived financially, socially and aren't aware about the STDs? Yeah. Of course, the new law which is now being shaped probably has got all these provisions. But experience from other countries says that a place where a brothel where officially legally prostitution is carried out, the inmates of the prostitution all have to be medically tested, checked. They have to be advised. Precautions have to be taken. That is one way where if you legally allow prostitution, then it is the duty of the government also to provide them health care, medical facilities, so that sexually transmitted diseases do, do not transmit outside the, 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 the vicinity of that particular place, customers and all, all of them getting infected. That's a good thing. But I suppose I have not read the new law, only the bare thing I read. Probably these things are there. In foreign countries, very normal, where uh, prostitution is legally permitted and uh, they have to... A weekly or I don't know, there's a cycle where they have to get tested for all these kinds of sexually transmitted diseases. Thank you, sir. Um, our next question has a slightly different view. Um, the person says, Sir, can you please elaborate on how is prostitution morally illegal and why is it taking so much time to legalize prostitution in India? How is it prostitution morally? Illegal. And why is no. it taking so Either much time to Either it can be morally legalize. correct or legally correct. <laughs> right? Either it is moral or immoral. Okay. So first we go by this classification. Morally right or morally wrong. It all depends upon the societal views. What acts are socially permitted as good is morally good. What acts are socially prohibited is morally bad and immoral in the sense. Now coming back to the legal aspect of it. A morally good may be permitted legally also no issue. But immoral act 
may be legalized when the law sanctions carrying of that activity so the taking care of a particular activity by law is to regulate that activity now if you ask me if we consider morally prostitution is bad then why it has been regularized legalized please understand if you do not legalize there are other implications there are livelihood implications there are implications on right to health there are other implications which may arise because of which though certain sections of the society may say it is illegal immoral sorry it is legally permitted to regulate it that's all legally recognized i don't say legally it is good or bad i say it is legally regulated so that the ill effects of prostitution on health do, do not uh, b- 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 hamper the entire for prostitution activity understood sir i think we can take one last question in the chat um the question says so during the covid pandemic especially the second wave there were instances of several children getting orphaned and had no kin to take care of them and there were appeals on social media to adopt these children isn't there a risk of these children getting trafficked and exploited what laws can prevent this from happening and what can we do as regular citizens 100% the concern that you have raised is already being circulated government knows about it that these orphan children if not cared for if left for caring by their own guardians etc may lead to exploitation of any one kind so what we should do of course as far as adoption is concerned the government now has set up various committees there is a, in karnataka itself there is an i don't i don't get the kannada word exactly but there is an uh, adoption institution where these children go are admitted there and then anyone who wants to legally adopt them has to undergo a process of counseling or filling up forms that is what anyone wanting to adopt can do that what happens is if out of sympathy out of pity pity of the uh, the, the children or friend you adopt tomorrow some complications come you will be considered as a trafficker so it is always better to legally adopt yes as citizens you can always contribute to that if you feel like adopting anyone you can approach the government you can go approach the government adoption center and then by following all the procedure you can adopt them of course the government on its own is now thinking of having uh, adopting these children government itself adopts this and takes care of their food shelter and clothing yeah thank you Thank you so much students for raising such pertinent questions and of course Dr Suresh for answering them all so thoroughly. Um participants please note that after the vote of thanks we will be posting the link for the feedback form in the chat box and note that only if you fill out this feedback form will you be eligible to receive a certificate of participation for this webinar. I now invite our vice principal Mrs Pauline Priya to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you Thangam and a very good evening to one and all. I have been given the pleasurable task of proposing the vote of thanks for this program. On behalf of the director, Father Gerald Jesusa SJ, the principal Dr. Pratima Prabhakar, the staff and students of St. Joseph's College of Law, I extend a heartfelt gratitude to Professor Dr. Sudesh. Sir, I count myself among the very lucky students who have been taught by you whenever sir has walked into our class he has held the room with his command on the subject his eloquence and very many other factors if i had given an opportunity i would embark on an endless litany of things about sir that has wowed many students like me thank you very much sir Sir is someone who always encourages students to explore, express, and excel academically and creatively. Once again, sir, thank you for such an engaging session, and thank you for graciously taking up the questions of our students. I am sure our students have gained much from this session. I thank all the students, research scholars. and the very many of you who have joined us for today's webinar i also thank ms tangam who has emceed the session and i also thank mr balraj and padikshit for lending us the technical support thank you all i'm not going to stand any longer between your tea and uh, yourself thank you very much thank you thank you pauline
Yeah, I am waiting for the tea to be served on. <laughs> because you said you are not going to wait any longer between me and my tea. Thank you very okay. much. God bless you all. I thank the management of St. Joseph's College of Law. I thank uh, your principal and my very good friend, Dr. Pratima Prabhakar, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, this was a very important topic. I hope uh, in coming days you will do more research and contribute to your own uh, uh, you in your own manner to eradicate this problem. Thank you, one and all. Thank you for listening very patiently. Thank you all. Goodbye. Participants, the feedback form has been put up in the group chat.